My name's Kenny Harris. I am the artist who made all of these and much more. So uh, I usually try to start these talks just by explaining where this show actually came from. Uh, I'm, I'm an artist from Syracuse, New York. This project started, I, I did an artist residency in Ireland, in Valley Vaughan, Ireland back in 2013. And uh, in America, we have this kind of perspective about mythology. The mythology is very separate from life. When you travel, when you go to other places around the world, you realize that most of the world, that's not the case. And so I was traveling to Ireland, I landed in Dublin, and I had a contact that I was meeting there. Uh, and I got off the plane, he shook my hand, and he goes, hi, welcome to Ireland, fairies are real. And so that was my introduction to Ireland. And from that point on, the two months that I spent there, everything is done in this perspective of you really don't question if fairies are real or not. And so when I came back to America and, and started really thinking about mythology, um, I started this project in Ireland, but when I really started thinking about it when I got back, uh, we have this perspective here that, that science and supernatural don't really go hand in hand. The mythology and real are not the same thing. Um, but in a lot of the world, it's not very questioned. Uh, and so when I started this project in Ireland, um, it was very much born of trying to explore how we think about mythology and how we as humans uh, portray mythology. Mythology in general uh, is, is an allegory. It's, it's a story that speaks of something outside of itself. Um, and it's a very basic definition of what mythology is, and, and I like a basic definition because it opens up the doors to a lot of different ways to look at mythology. Um, and so they're really stories where we're meant to understand the world with. And so this isn't something that was just happening 2,000 years ago or 500 years ago. It's still something that's happening today. We try to understand our world. We try to understand our lives and ourselves a little bit better through the stories that are being told. Um, this is why fairy tales tend to live so long. Uh, is because we learn so much from them. When I started this project in Ireland. Uh, it was originally just two-dimensional images on the wall. Um, I worked in theater for four years, and so while I was working on this project, uh, somebody in Ireland said to me, you know, think about how to make these a little bit more dramatic. And I was like, well, from a theatrical standpoint, how can I make them more dramatic? And so there was a stage in a barn um, next to the artist residency, and it used to be an actual stage in the town, so it still had theater lighting in it. And so I went outside and I cut out one of the figures, actually this one right here, uh, and I put it on the side of the stage and I lit it up with one of the theater lights and the shadow that it cast opened up a whole new door for me. And so instead of thinking about these as two dimensional images and not thinking about them as three dimensional images, but thinking of them as kind of two and a half dimensional, um, something that is two dimensional but interacts with the space in a very different way. And so it was kind of born out of that need for drama, of trying to create something in the space that was visually interesting. Um, a lot of you notice as soon as you walk into the space that there are tons of shadows everywhere. It's entirely intentional. Uh, that's the reason there are clear shelves instead of wooden shelves or steel shelves or anything is to be able to cast those shadows. Uh, Joseph Campbell, who is the contemporary expert on mythology, theorizes that we only know about 10% of the myths that have been told over time through cultural assimilation, cultures being wiped out, stories just not being told anymore, or us just never knowing about it at all, uh, culture being completely isolated from us hearing about it, um, that we don't know most of the stories. And so how do we represent myths that we don't actually even know are there? Uh, shadows become a great way to do that um, because the shadows that are on the wall start to take this kind of amorphic form. There's something that you can start creating new stories out of. And so they represent the stuff that we don't know that have existed, but they also represent what hasn't existed yet. Um, mythology is born out of human beings' innate desire for creativity. And so through those shadows, we're able to create new form, create new stories, create new narratives, and participate in that same act of uh, creating mythology that's existed for longer than our species has. Um, and so the shadows actually serve a very important purpose to this. It's also why we have to have very complicated lighting in here um, to make sure that shadows are, be shadows are being cast from multiple directions uh, so that we can appreciate this in many different ways. Um, in this show alone, there are 767 figures. Uh, overall, there's about 1,957. They can't all fit in one show. I have tried, it is impossible. Um, and so every single time I do this show, it looks very different. I find new ways to mix them together. Uh, when I put them on shelves, it's largely out of complete aesthetics. How do they look in the space alone? Um, and so uh, a few new things that I tried with this show, this is the 23rd time I've done this show. Um, if you walk in the space, you'll immediately notice all these figures are facing the center. 
All of those figures are facing the center, and so we're drawn into the center of the space. That's something I've never done before. Um, and so uh, every time I do the show, I learn new things. I come to it with a completely new perspective on how I want to approach it. Uh, and I find new ways to make figures interact with the space that not only make the space visually more interesting, but makes the shadows a little bit more interesting and makes our engagement in the space much more interesting. The pillar that's in the center of the room that you see is rotating very slowly. Uh, the reason for that is when we walk into a gallery space, we kind of have this solemn, kind of taking our time, very slow pace walking through it. Once that is rotating and we have these shadows that are cast on the walls, the room becomes a little bit more animated, a little bit more playful. Um, so that we're taken out of that really kind of stagnant mindset and put in something that's a little bit more active. Uh, I want people to come into the space and have fun. I want people to come into the space and be overcome with whimsy, not fear. Uh, mythology has a tendency to focus on fear, the things that we're scared of because we don't understand. Um, humans don't have sharp claws, we don't have sharp teeth. Our one thing is that we know things. That's how we evolved, that's how we got to the point where we are. So when we don't understand things, we get scared. And mythology is our way to tackle that. But how do I take the fear out of that? Um, setting up a space that feels animated, it feels playful, it feels whimsical. The figures, all of them are, well, most of them are smiling, something that's more welcoming. There are outright figures just waving at you, welcoming you into the space, that you're not coming in here and being scared. Um, and that's the goal, is to experience mythology in a completely different way. Uh, and when you leave, hopefully having a good experience, a positive experience, um, where even the things that you should be scared of are not that scary anymore. Um, what was the reasoning behind deciding to change the direction that they're facing? And when they weren't facing sorry, these specific directions, were they, because some are sideways and some are forward, so were they all facing each other? And uh, It used to be that they were all just intermingled. It wasn't really thinking about which direction they faced. It was, again, thinking aesthetically, how does it flow on the shelf? And so having them facing multiple directions just worked for the flow better. Um, the reason that I wanted it this time was uh, the most recent show that I did, the one right before this, um, this has 14 shelves in it, that one had 34. And so there were a lot of figures out. Uh, but I did one entire wall where everything was facing one direction and the flow of the room completely changed as soon as you walk in and see that. And so again, if the point of this pillar is to make the space more animated, by pushing people through the space in that kind of psychic direction, psychological direction, it just leads people through the space more, makes it more animated and directional. Um, what I did learn from this experience of, of setting it up this way is I have a tendency to make figures face left and not a tendency to make figures face right. So I had almost two times as many figures facing left as I did right. Um, so now I have to make a bunch more that face right. Uh, the only way to learn is to actually see what the pattern is, and now I know that the pattern's there. Um, so it was a learning experience. And I actually really appreciate the way that it came out this time. Uh, I think this is the way going forward that I'm going to continue doing it, because uh, I really like the impact that it's had on the movement in the space. A big challenge, no? to, to create a mythology like a Platon or Homero. So, um... So what is the, 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 the idea in the, future, in the future for you with this area? Do you plan to, to make some project uh, forward of this? Or? I mean, I, for a long time, I've, again, I've been working on this since 2013, and I'd actually had a plan on retiring it in 2021. Um, and then, uh, again, I'm from Syracuse, and there's an art museum in Syracuse called the Everson Art Museum. And when I was growing up, that's where I'd go like sing Christmas songs in the choir. And so I had this goal since I was 10 years old to do a show there. And so in 2021, I had a house fire that actually destroyed quite a bit of the show. Um, and a week later, I got a phone call from Everson Museum asking me to go do a show. So I had to rebuild this. Uh, and that meant I can't retire it. Once you rebuild it, it has to have its second life. You can't just stop. Um, and so now it does have all these plans going forward. Next, it's in um, Scranton, Pennsylvania. Um, that's the next one that I'm building towards. And so when you're an installation artist, uh, it can be very difficult to do a project because you're a painter in a, in a collage. So when you, when you do paintings and collages, uh, you can step back. You can stop looking at it for a little bit, walk away, come back to it with fresh eyes, and experience it again. And that's when you're going to make really good decisions. 
Installation artists can't really do that. Every time I do a show, it's that stepping back and looking at it again. And so every time I do the show, it's new lessons, new ways to learn. And I know there's never gonna be a point, and I've learned this, I was a painter for many years, I never reach a point where I feel like a piece of artwork is done. I just get to a point where I feel like the next project has to tackle those questions. Um, and I'm not there yet, where I feel like I, I have to be moving on to the next thing. Because there's still a lot of aspects of this show I don't think I've figured out yet. Uh, and so I have lots of plans going forward. Most of those plans are almost frustratingly trying to tackle the problems that I see every time I do the show. Um, for example, this time all the figures pointed towards the center was one way that I tackled issues I've had previously. Um, all the electronics that are in here, the pillar, the lights, everything, uh, are controlled by my phone this time, which is nice because it means I can monitor it no matter where I am. And so there's a lot of issues that kind of pop up every time I do the show that I'm able to tackle as I do the next one and the next one and the next one. And so next year it's being shown six times. Um, this year it was shown nine times. Uh, and so every time I show it, I'm able to just learn a little bit more for it. Is there a reason for the black and white instead of using color at all? So uh, a little bit on my background here, I have a BFA in painting from SUNY Brockport, a BS in psychology from SUNY Brockport with uh, an emphasis in uh, sensation and perception. Um, then an MFA in studio art from Moore College of Art and Design in Philadelphia. But the sensation perception, my specific area of study was color theory. Um, I, I am so comfortable working with color that when I started working on this, I was leaning on it way too much. That if I want to control people's emotions, very easy to do when you're throwing color into a project. And so how do I really think about figures, their facial expressions, their poses, their body language, if I'm leaning so heavily on color? And so color had to be removed so that I could really think about physically in the space what the figures were doing. Um, and there have been times over the past 10 years where I have like gone in and made a figure that uses color, but I never end up, you know, it's, it's one of those things that if you have one figure that uses color, you have to have like a hundred that use color. And so they're just not ones that I think have worked well enough um, because they do, they lead your emotion way too much. Uh, and, and color is, is so heavy, it's so heavy. How do you think it would impact or change the story or the narrative or the audience perception if you did add some figures with color? It, it's difficult to say until I do it. Uh, that's kind of the hard part with this many figures. Um, because if, again, if there was one figure out there with color, it would be the automatic focal point. And so I would have to have enough out there so they feel like they're not meant to be the focal points. Um, and so it, it's really hard for me to determine it until I actually do it. Um, which has been the big issue with if I want to do it or not, because I could get 150 figures done with color, do a show, and then be like, wow, that worked none. Like, there, there was no actual success in using color. Um, and so it's one of those things that if I choose to do it, I'm gonna have to like really dive into it uh, and not hold back from it. And so I think that that would be one of the issues. I have done, in the past, I've experimented, um, one of my previous positions teaching, I had a very big office and I had whole installations set up in the office that I could play with things. Uh, and I tried like things like color lighting, um, instead of doing color on the figures, using color in the space, um, things like that. But they ended up, again, really guiding emotional interpretation a bit too much. You know, and, and you don't, it's one of those things you don't actively really think about, but as soon as the space is blue, how is that gonna make you feel versus red? And so you're coming into them in a very different way. Uh, and so it ends up being one of those things that I feel drives the narrative way too much when there's a little bit of ambiguity in the narrative now that leans towards positivity. When you uh, figure out how to put them together, do you, is, is the grouping based on the kinds of myths that they belong to, or how do you decide how to put them together? So when they're actually put into space, it's largely aesthetic. It's about how it looks more than anything else. Um, what I've learned over years of doing this is, is it's not the black that draws it, it's not the white that draws it, it's the combination, it's the juxtaposition of the two colors, and that's what creates the drama. And so if you look at the shelves in general with all the figures on them, some of them have a little bit more black, some of them have a little bit less black, um, but for the most part they're fairly even and it's kind of spread out through that. Um, I do have one themed shelf, I did it accidentally 
uh, in Norwich, New York, I don't know, four years ago. Um, I accidentally did a shelf where all my figures who look like they're dancing were put together, and I called it the dance party shelf. Uh, and it just happened on accident, but now in every single show there's a dance party shelf. Um, except for, I did a show in Barrie, Vermont, just a couple months after my dad passed. I didn't feel like a dance party at the time. And so I had a whole shelf where it was all just figures solemnly sitting. Um, and so that was the one time I haven't done it since then. But I like having a dance party shelf. Uh, it, it usually raises people's spirits if they just come in and stare at a bunch of things dancing. So I noticed with it being an installation exhibition and you have some that are located underneath the shelves, have you ever experimented with the boundaries of where to place your artwork between hanging from ceilings or walls or floors? Uh, I actually have some that are made to be hung from the ceiling. I have some that are made to be hung from the walls. So they're flat on the wall surface. Mm -hmm. um, and I have a lot that are meant to be hung underneath the shelves. Um, it, it's really more of up to the space, I guess. Uh, I did a show in uh, New Hampshire, at the New Hampshire Institute of Art. Um, and the ceiling was like a drop ceiling and it had all these bars going across. I hung things from the ceiling all over the place and there was like the perfect space for hanging things up on the ceiling. Um, and I've played with in the past, uh, hanging things from the ceiling and having light behind them so that there's shadows on the floor as well. But some floors like this is a little bit reflective are a little less great for that. Um, and I haven't really found a floor where I'm like, that's perfect for shadows. Uh, and so I do play with that stuff all the time. And, the flat ones on the walls have actually been some of my favorites over the years to put up, um, but it really depends on how much I want to tackle shadows. Uh, because if the wall is, I, I did a, a show in Syracuse where the walls were, um, I don't know, they were like Berber. They were like brownish walls. And the shadows basically didn't show up on the walls at all. Uh, but that meant that I could put a lot of things flat on the wall without interrupting shadows at that point. Um, so it has a lot to do with how much I want to be seeing the shadows for those. I've also thought of things like micro projectors that are projecting shadows for a figure that isn't there. Um, things like that that can really kind of mess with people a little bit. Uh, and so, I, I mean, my whole goal in my artwork in general is that I, I like playing. Um, I, there, there are points when you have to take it seriously, but there are points when you just need to have fun and play. And so I'm always doing that. Every single time I do the show, I try to make sure there's some play in it too. Is there a certain period of mythology that you're thinking of when you're going and putting these figures together or what's your kind of inspiration process when you're building and adding a new character to the collection? Uh, so really, I, it's kind of an eclectic, I have a list of uh, every myth that's in here on my phone. Um, plus myths that I haven't done. Uh, the list is currently about 9,800 figures long. Um, and so there's a lot that I haven't done that are on my list that I'm like, oh, I really need to do that, and I just don't. Um, but uh, what ends up happening, I spend a lot of time doing research. That's most of my life. Um, I'm researching mythology, and not just myths from 2,000 years ago, but you know, cryptids that people are reporting in Chicago today, you know, and things like that where, where I'm trying to read all these different stories and, and hear what people are thinking about mythology. Uh, and usually what that ends up meaning is that I add 20 things to my list um, because I, you know, I, I read about fairies in Ireland, for example, and I read about fairies in Ireland, of course, then I'm going to be referenced to fairies in Scotland. But then there are equivalent fairies in Thailand. And there are equivalent fairies in Chile. So I can keep going to all these different areas and this starts adding to the list and adding to the list. Um, and that's where a lot of the fun is actually too. And I think kind of the spirit of this project is that when you're finding those similarities all over the world, you're seeing where, where we're all talking about the same things. Um, and that's what makes it so interesting is to be able to jump through all these parts of the world and, and just see what the stories are saying. Because uh, we're all kind of just scared of the same stuff. I mean, it's just kind of human nature. Um, and that's what makes mythology so interesting to me. So there's never really an era. Uh, it, it's usually far more eclectic than I'd like it to be. Um, early when I started making the list, which I started making the list when I was eight years old. Um, but when I started making the list, obviously I wasn't writing down where a myth came from. So I have to spend a lot of time saying, what is this? I have no clue what this is. Um, and then doing the research all over again because I never put that information. But that's what's nice too is that, that I'm learning over and over and over again. 
There are some general questions that I get usually when I do an art talk. Uh, the first is, what is my favorite myth? I don't have a favorite myth. Um, I see connections between stories, and that makes me really appreciate them. But what happens is you see connections and you start, you stop differentiating between one myth and another because the stories are so similar that it's hard to pick one. And so if I have to pick a type of myth, it's pretty much anything the cat in it I'm gonna like. Um, and so I really like stories that have cats because when, when you get stories that have uh, hybrid creatures like dragons or terrasque or anything like that, um, and you get things with you know, giant dogs and, and sea monsters, they're usually these really scary things. But cats are weird because in mythology, some cultures, they're, they're not good. And in some cultures, they're great. In most cultures, they're just troublemakers. And I really like that they, they cover the whole gamut of, of what myths can possibly be. And so when you hear that a story is about a giant cat, you're like, which one is this going to be? Is this going to be a mischievous cat? Is this going to be a, a, a murdering cat? What is it going to be? Um, and that makes them interesting every single time. The hard part of that is that when you're doing a project like this where there's a stylistic uniformity, there's only so many times that you can have a cat myth before you're like, which giant cat is this? Is this this one or this one? Because there's so many of them all over the world. Um, it's kind of, I guess, a unifying thing of all humans is that we like cats. The next one that I always get, what is my favorite figure? Um, which one of them out of all of these would be my favorite? My usual answer, and it feels kind of like a, a lazy answer, but it's an honest answer, whichever one I finished most recently. Um, when there's thousands of them, when there's almost 2,000 of them, it's really hard to pick a favorite because each time you make one, you're learning. And, and so the next one is probably going to be better than the previous one, and the next one after that is probably going to be better than that. And so the obvious answer is the one that I finished most recently because that's the one that's full of the most information. That's the one that's been researched the most. Um, right now it's the puka, which is this little guy over here, which is an Irish myth. Um, and so uh, I really enjoyed working on it. Pukas are shapeshifters, which automatically makes them hard to make a drawing of because they can literally be anything. Um, but it, what it meant was I took all the descriptions of puka, um, and there are several stories in Irish mythology about them. The most famous is uh, um, Sean Chin the Bard's uh, The Piper and the Puka. Um, but I took all the descriptions of the Puka and, and what it shaped, shape shifted into and tried to combine them together into a single figure. And so the stories have him as a horse, have him as a human, have him as a rabbit, have him as a cat. And so he's a bunch of different things. And so how do you combine them together into one kind of figure? Um, and so it was a lot of fun to work on something like a shapeshifter because. I mean, with most of these figures, I always have to tell myself, I can't be wrong. But with a shapeshifter, I definitely can't be wrong. Um, could you speak a bit about little demon Bob over here? The little what? Little demon. He looks like SpongeBob. Oh, it is SpongeBob. He, he looks like it demon SpongeBob. SpongeBob. Um, so first of all, there are a lot of pop culture references out here, too. Uh, not everybody can enter a piece of artwork through, let's say, Greek mythology, um, Irish mythology or have any cultural heritage that they've thoroughly researched to be able to enter a project like this. Pop culture becomes a good way to invite people in who might only have pop culture to reference. Um, and so Spongebob I specifically chose because I'm from Syracuse. Tom Kenny is from Syracuse. The guy who voices Spongebob. Um, and so every time I do a show I feel like I have to have Spongebob in it to represent the town I'm from. Um, but yes, there is a Spongebob out there. There's Spider-Man, there's Venom, General Grievous. There's a ton of random references that I never expect anybody to ever get because they're things that only I'm probably going to know. Um, every single show for the past five shows, uh, there's a Waldo. So you can play Where's Waldo if you really feel like it.